I teach college, as many of you know. I teach meditation for credit at University of New Mexico. And uh, there's definitely a pervasive sense of unease in recent years among my students. One of the things that I do um, early on in the semester is I ask the students present um, how many of them have experienced uh, depression or anxiety to the extent that it negatively impacts their lives. Basically, everyone raises their hands. It used to be there was like a very chilled out stoner or two who was like, oh, nothing bothers me, but even now, <laughs> even they're worried now, you know, so <laughs> everybody's anxious. I do really feel that it's like really brimming under the surface. And, um, you know, on the one hand, at the end of the world has seemed imminent in a way ever since I was born in 1957 because of the bomb and, um, but it just seems like it's gotten more and more and more pointed. There was a moment maybe around the turn of the century where, look, for a little while, like everything was going to be okay, but that didn't last, did it? <laughs> um, but they call it samsara for a reason, right? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, if you look back through history, there have been many times when things have been bad, very difficult. I want to share again something I've talked about before, but... Um, some of you have heard me say this already, but uh, I basically have been talking to Shish and Roshi almost every week for a few years as I've been finishing my training with Skype. And uh, before, just before the last presidential election, there was, that's, that's when I really feel like this feeling of, of unease in the country has started to become more and more palpable. I remember talking to Shishin Roshi about it, and uh, as you've heard me say before, what he said was, I allow myself to be upset by this. I allow myself to be upset. And um, I've repeated that so many times since, because uh, because I talked to many Dharma groups, and there's some people in some Dharma organizations who don't want to deal with it, don't want to look at it. And then there's others who are so upset by the way things are going that that's all they can think about. And their lives are just out of balance. And they're, they're wandering around under, oh, really unable to do very much to help because they're so distraught all the time. And, uh, it just struck me that what Shishin Roshi said has to do with the balance between the wisdom side of our practice and the emptiness, uh, sorry, the wisdom or emptiness side of our practice and the compassion side. So it's possible to hide out in emptiness, to say, well, you know, there are trillion stars out there, it's a big universe, and, and there's other worlds, and there's other, you know, species go extinct all the time, and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, actually, I do take that into account, you know, in, uh, in dealing with this because the universe is a big place and we're not the only species and we, if we did go extinct, we're not the only ones who've gone extinct. These things happen on the big scale. On the small scale, though, I really don't want that to happen. <laughs> and so that's the compassion side. But I don't think we have to grasp the compassion side so tightly that it drags us down and ruins our lives. Somewhere in between there, there's a, there's a balance. Um, I think Yugen said something to that effect yesterday, uh, that uh, if the world was going to end at the end of this week, we, wouldn't we want to appreciate the beauty and love what's here while we have the chance to do so? Yeah. So, not to mention the fact that uh, that if we're lost in, in uh, distress, that we can't really do much to help that's effective. <clears throat> and uh, our teachers are a good example. Shishin Roshi and Shinko Roshi don't seem to have lost their joy and love for life, and yet they're deeply concerned about these issues. So I think that's, they're not a bad model for how to conduct ourselves, that both things can coexist. 
I do want to say this discussion can get so heavy and um, I for one don't believe the most dire predictions. I'm not minimizing but uh, I know we're going to have big trouble and if we don't do something to reset the balance the earth will. There will be droughts and famines and disasters and all sorts of things but um, I don't know that any of it is is uh, intractable. Um, we were talking also about the tipping points and there are many possible tipping points to come and we've definitely passed some of them, there's no doubt about it. Um, but you have to remember I teach college students and any of you who've ever been college students or are currently college students know what do college students do when they have a big assignment. <laughs> they do it the night before. <laughs> and actually all human beings are like this, I'm afraid. So we're waiting till the night before and I really hope we're not procrastinating too far. Um, but I do see people starting to recognize what's happening and you know I'm so concerned and I have been since I, I was a child uh, about the extermination of species and of natural places. I remember crying about that when I was eight, nine, ten years old. I would, I would go get books on nature from the library and um, I would literally cry over the fate of, of certain animal species that have died out, you know, and uh, it's gotten worse and worse. But then again, you know, because I work with college students, there's a generation of college students now that a lot of them are not only anxious and depressed, but, but they're very pessimistic and almost on the point of despair. There's a whole other movement among young people which is very encouraging, which is people who are getting roused up and, and doing something about the situation. But there's a lot of them who just seem to have the attitude of, what's the use? We, we inherited a shitty world and, and we're not going to be able to fix it, you know? And, uh, and human beings suck anyway, you know, and, and there's all this violence and, and mayhem and everything. And when I hear that from my college students, I often find myself saying, did anything violent happen to you today? Did anything really bad happen to you today? Did any, was anybody even really unpleasant to you today? You know, and, and how many instances of, instances of cooperation contributed to your life today? And it's, you know, we, we notice the negatives because we've got a giant negative in our world happening right now, or a number of giant negatives. But I don't think we can say that's the norm. I really don't. You know, I've been driving, last time I had a traffic accident was when I was 18 years old. I'm 62 now. I had somebody do the math. That's a lot of years of a lot of cooperation on the road. You know, nobody has just come out of nowhere and crashed into me. Or if they tried to do it, I managed to avoid it. But anyway, <laughs> my point being that most of the time I'm on the road, everybody's cooperating. They stop. It's, every once in a while there's a jerk, you know. But, um, but most of the time it's kind of amazing. People of all backgrounds, all religious persuasions, all cultural backgrounds, all uh, people from blue states, people from red states, they just stop at those stoplights. And when it turns green, they go through it. And every once in a while, they squeeze it on a yellow one. But, you know, in general, there's a lot of cooperation. You know, where do we get our food from? Who made, who made the fibers in this rug? Who shipped the rug? Who sold the rug? You know, the ceiling, I don't even know what it's made of, whatever it's made of. You know, <laughs> where did it come from? Where, who made it? Who cut it into the squares of the right size? Who installed it? You know, we're just surrounded by cooperation all the time. Not to mention the state this place was in when the Roshis took it over <laughs> and all the work that they've done, you know, just to support us being here. And then none of us have done anything really bad. I mean, squirming in the Zendo is about the worst I've seen, you know. <laughs> really, nobody's done anything really bad, you know. We're all pretty cooperative, you know, when it comes down to it. And uh, if you think about it, Europe has been rebuilt basically twice in the last century. Not because it needed to be, not because people looked and thought, well, we 
we should really should do something about those old buildings. Some of them are moldy. We should fix them up. You know, I, I, you know, many many cities were just devastated by two wars, and everybody pitched in and and restored restored them twice. You know, and it's not like the second when I mean, the second war, which is only what thirty years after the first, not even uh, Second World War. It's not like everybody said, "Oh, we're not doing that again." You, you know. People step up when they have to. The, I think a lot of the issue is, as I'll get to in a little while, is consciousness. Is consciousness. Um, so we do need to wake up and act, and I hope we haven't procrastinated too long and we can still get the paper done, you know, before it has to be turned in, so to speak. But first I want to double back to our tradition, and our tradition's been really linked to nature from the beginning. And I want to read a poem here by Hanshan, the, uh, who's known as the Cold Mountain Poet. He was a Buddhist hermit um, from China in the 7th century, China, A.D. <coughs> Oh, something like 1,200 years after the time of the Buddha, which shows how well this tradition sustains. This is a translation by Gary Snyder. Clambering up the cold mountain path, the cold mountain trail goes on and on, the long gorge choked with scree and boulders, the wide creek, the mist-blurred grass. The moss is slippery, so there's been no rain. The pine sings, but there's no wind. Who can leap the world's ties and sit with me among the white clouds? It's such a lovely statement to me of intimacy with his environment. Of course, I don't think this is a time when we can all go off and sit in caves. The situation is a little too um, pointed for that. We can't do what, like what Milarepa did and spend 12 years in a cave eating only nettles until his skin turned green. Although that's a vegan diet, for sure. <laughs> yeah. But uh, And then the Buddha, where did he go to find enlightenment? And where did the original Buddhist monks go to find enlightenment? They went to the forests. So that's been with us from the beginning. I want to talk a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes. But um, first of all, I just thinking about this topic made me cast my mind back to uh, growing up in Miami Beach, Florida. And people have imagined Miami Beach as this beautiful tropical paradise um, and, uh, you know, a natural environment with palm trees and, and all sorts of lovely stuff. Well, the truth about Miami Beach, there are places like that, but Miami Beach was a mangrove uh, sandbar and they basically raised the mangroves and just paved over the whole sandbar. There's not a speck of Miami Beach that's natural. Anything, mm -hmm. any, there are palm trees, but they were all planted where they, they are. There are, there are hibiscus bushes, but they were all planted there. Mostly what there is is hotels and hotels and hotels and hotels. And that just weighed upon me even as a child. When I was eight years old, some of the neighborhood kids discovered this um, abandoned estate and uh, it had kind of gone back to nature, and it was the only place we could find that seemed halfway natural. It still had an old barn and an old house on it, but they were abandoned. And maybe an acre or two, a couple of acres of land. And we named it the Spook House. <laughs> and we would go to the Spook House virtually every day after school and catch lizards and frogs. And every once in a while we'd get lucky and, and find a ring snake. And that place just fed us, and remarkably, um, uh, as Daishin was saying, those were the days when you could just, you could be eight years old and go off and wander the woods. Not only did we wander the woods, but then we wanted a little more than the spook house, and we discovered that if you took 
three buses and transferred all the way across Miami that you could get to uh, one of the northernmost keys, um, Virginia Key, which was mostly still wild. And we would take three buses with our buckets and necks, raggedy nets, ra raggedy <laughs> kids in our cutoff shorts and, and, um, and prowl around the swamp. And um, it was right next to the um, zoo, to the Crandon Park Zoo. And there actually were some escaped animals. Um, the, uh, anybody know what a capybara is? Mm -hmm. It's like a 50 pound rodent. Yes, I bet you would, <laughs> oh, bet you would know Shinko Hoshi. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so they had escaped and they were, yeah, every once in a while you'd see this 50 pound rodent, it was so great, you know. Uh, but uh, the thirst, the, the, the craving for nature was so intense that we would go and do that. Uh, the irony is, my hometown of Miami Beach is slated to be the first city in the United States that goes underwater. Because yeah. it's built on limestone, mm -hmm. so it's, the water just is going to seep up from underneath. It's not like you can build seawalls to keep it out. So, um, And then when I got older, I, uh, I left Florida as soon as I could manage for California. and. The first of what I would call spiritual experiences happened when I was just stunned by the beauty of California in those days, in, um, 1970s, and uh, mm, I don't know, just watching sunsets and, and hiking in the mountains and going out to the deserts, and it, it's just the abundance, and it, it was just like nothing I'd ever experienced. How much wildness there is, even folded in among the habitation. You know, the West was a whole different scene from, from Florida. Um, so I, uh, and then, and then of course, training here and at Zen Mountain Monastery in the Catskills, which is on, I don't know how big the nature preserve it butts up to as uh, many thousands of acres of woodland. Um, I just feel, I feel very fortunate. And then Tanya and I, or caretakers of a nature preserve and hot spring in, in New Mexico. And that abutted upon uh, the Pecos wilderness, uh, the land around it ran straight into the Pecos wilderness, which is hundreds of miles of wilderness. And we would look out and just see wilderness. And I used to say to Tanya, you know, we might be rations to be able to live in this. I thought it might be a, time, a good time to go back and look at the Buddha's enlightenment, which is what we're commemorating. And uh, I, I'd already mentioned that the Buddha didn't feel he could find enlightenment in the palace. We're talking now about the, the uh, legend of how the Buddha grew up in the palace. And the, uh, let's just say the story's been a little inflated over time, but it, it makes mythic sense. And a lot of it, no doubt, actually happened this way, that he went out to the forest to discover enlightenment that he sat beneath a tree. Notice he sat beneath a tree. He didn't sit at the top of a cliff overlooking a valley. He didn't sit at the top of a mountain. He sat beneath a living thing. It's where he got shelter. And we all know the story of the last night of him sitting there it's varying accounts. Some accounts say he sat for 45 days, some say a week, some say only three days, some say one day and one night. Um, but th what all the accounts seem to share is the temptations he endured on the last night, which is these uh, terrifying and seductive, both um, apparitions sent by Mara, the, the god of illusion. And... Uh, challenging the Buddha through the night, through, uh, through all of which it is said that he, he sits firm. He doesn't go after the desire, he doesn't flee from the frightening apparitions. But finally, so the story goes, Mara issues his final challenge, which is, by whose right do you sit here seeking enlightenment? Who's, who's going to sanctify your enlightenment? Who's going to certify you? Who's going to give you the right color rock suit, right? <laughs> mm. And it said, I've always been so struck with this, 
probably we all, we all know because there's so many statues of the Earth Witness Mudra. Do we have one in here? Of the, we probably have one somewhere of the Buddha reaching down and touching the Earth and saying, the Earth will be my witness. So, so the Earth will be my witness. The one of the... On the, the other statue out there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, all the Buddhas start to blend for me after a while. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it reaches down and touches the earth. I've, I've always thought that's so striking and it's so symbolic. It's a, uh, it's a gesture of intimacy. It's a gesture of this is, this is home. You know? And I do think the earth is a remarkable home. It's, I mean, it's the best place I've ever lived. <laughs> um, but uh, he, didn't ask, he didn't ask the gods or supernatural beings or spirits to confirm him. He reached for the earth and said, the earth itself will, will witness me. And then, as the story goes, as the dawn breaks over the hills, the Buddha looks up and sees the morning star. And, that's, and at that moment realizes enlightenment. And... Of course, that's another natural phenomenon, and we might imagine, however long he's been sitting in meditation through all of this, that to look up and see that morning star would have been a moment of great beauty, even awe, wonder. Um, and it wasn't a conceptual seeing, it was a direct intimacy with what was seen, there was no self in the way. True, truly intimate experience. And there are, again, a number of versions of what he says upon seeing the star and realizing enlightenment, but uh, this is my personal favorite. And it does come out of our, somewhere in our tradition. There are different versions even in the Zen tradition, but this one says, Together I, the great earth, and all beings have awakened. So all beings and the great earth. So who, who's already been called upon to provide witness for his enlightenment? Quite a statement of who he is and who we are and who we're intimate with, what we're intimate with, and what we realize, even in a glimpse, you know, of our true nature is intimacy with all things. So, and this is what's lacking, I think, in our world. How many of our world leaders have ever spent a night under a tree? Willingly, you know. <laughs> Probably not many. Um, we've, had, we've had secretaries of the interior who've never seen... Yosemite or Yellowstone National Park or the Rocky Mountains, you know, how can we, how can we expect them to preserve and protect something that they don't know, that they don't really know? I don't know exactly what to do about that with them except to elect people who do know. <laughs> um, but I think for people who grow up in entirely artificial environments, the natural world can easily seem a remote thing. You know, can easily see a remote thing. Not everybody's going to take three buses to get, you know, to get to a little patch of wilderness, you know. Um, and then a final thing um, about the Buddhist story is when so. Another legend goes, he transmitted the Dharma to Mahakaya Shapa. Um, it's said that the Buddha held up a flower and twirled it, right? So another living thing, another part of the earth. And it was a direct transmission or communication. He didn't hold up a rock or a monk's bowl. Certainly not a cell phone. <laughs> the cell phones in those days anywhere were made of stone, they were very heavy, <laughs> it would have been very hard to twirl them. Um, anyway, you get the idea. Uh, there are many, many, many other examples, 
Dogen, for instance, when he returned to Japan and wanted to start uh, a practice center, he went to the mountains. It's happened again and again and again. So. When Roshi and Roshi wanted to start <laughs> a, a different kind of center, they came out here, you know. So, so of course the question is, what can we do? What do we do about this? And of course, I think we all face this feeling of, there's almost 8 billion people in the world, what can I do to turn this whole thing around? There's a giant snowball effect happening uh, with global warming, climate change. What can I do about it? Um, I was uh, helping, Tanya and I were helping Shinko Roshi with her book proposal and uh, we were working with this quote, this well-known quote from the Dalai Lama, who said the, uh, that the world will be saved by the Western woman. That was a big relief to me, because it means I don't, you know, I don't have to do it. Right? <laughs> the, but, you know, the thing that struck me is um, he, he says the Western woman. He doesn't say which one. I mean, is it Corin? I, I don't you know. <laughs> Tanya, Tanya could do it if they just put her in charge. I know she could. <laughs> I'm always saying that. Mm. I, I do think that the feminine, which is, is what Shinko Roshi's book is about, is enormously needed to do, to change the way we're approaching the, the whole system of the way we approach what we call civilization. So there's practical stuff we have to do. And I just want to say something about practicality, which is there are so many things that need doing and so many things we can devote ourselves to. And you know, you'll have to forgive me, but some of the things that I see my students get caught up in seem to me to be relatively small issues compared to the giant one. And maybe that's something that we all do. You know, maybe, maybe we reach for something manageable, you know. Um, but there's a giant thing, you know, that's staring us all down that we have to deal with. So I really encourage us People are just going to do what they feel drawn to do, and we're going to serve in the way that we feel drawn to serve. And that's what we're going to do, because we're people, and that's what we do. But, um, but I encourage everybody to think about how can we turn what we want to do to serve, to serve this greater issue. Um, and we need to think about the short term, and we need to think about the long term. Of course, the short term is we got to vote some different people in, and I'm not going to get too political about this, but we can't fix the political system right away. That's slightly longer term. Uh, getting ourselves a social democracy, longer term yet. <laughs> um, a lot of that comes down to growing consciousness, which is where I want to go to next. But in the short term, we have to be practical and just vote in the other party. I know that they're only the lesser of two evils in some ways, but, but um, at least they'll do something about climate change, and we just have to do what's going to help in the short term. And educate, make sure people are registered to vote. These are all ways that we can help. Educate lovingly, as Daishin was talking about. And then there's other things. What does this really finally come down to? What does the problem come down to? It comes down to overpopulation. We don't hear much talk about overpopulation that we've exceeded the carrying capacity of our environment. And if we don't reset the balance, the Earth's going to do it. That's what happens. Anyway, I'm not going to go into any of those things particularly, um, but except uh, the other thing could be some kind of research <laughs> to, uh, um, to, to reverse the effects of what we've already 
got and working towards alternative energy, all these things can help in an enormous way, right? Um, also, um, thinking about the way that we um, eat, as we're thinking about here, even if we don't go completely to veganism, there are ways to reduce that impact, which is enormous, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've been having some conversations with Shishin Roshi lately about enlightened action. And uh, some of you know that I was with this group called the Great Peace March. Um, in 1986, we walked across the country um, as a demonstration for nuclear disarmament. And um, partly I want to bring this up because it allowed me to experience the entire country through my feet. It took nine months. It was more than 3,000 miles. But also, it uh, allowed me to experience group action and to see what that was like. It worked. It worked pretty well. You know, there was a fair amount of conflict, but, but it functioned nonetheless. Um, it's, uh, it's funny because I wasn't sure what kind of impact we had at the time. You know, we got some media for the cause, et cetera. We got arrested a few times, things like that, you know, for uh, nonviolent action. There were a lot of rallies. There were a lot of talks in schools. But the year after, while I was trying to write a book about the Peace March, which I ultimately failed at, instead I wrote my first novel, uh, Hope Valley, Hope Cap King, <laughs> um, but uh, which has the whole Peace March embedded in it, um, fictionally. Um, but some of my friends from the march uh, led a march in Russia, and the Soviet government actually allowed them to do a march, a peace march in Russia with Soviet citizens. They did Soviet tricks of the era, like my, uh, the marchers, when they reported it back to me, they said they were stunned to find that, contrary to, to the press, that every time they came into a new town, everything was fixed up, whitewashed, the store was stocked with, with all sorts of goods. There was no shortage of goods, everything was fine. Well, they later found out that basically there was a whole team of people, as soon as they left the town, they stripped the store of goods, they'd run to the next town, they'd paint everything, stick the, stick, <laughs> stick the, the, um, the, the stock back on the shelves, and, uh, and the people in the towns never got to buy it, so they were, they were actually setting this up for everyone, and this got leaked finally to the people who've been on the march because there were uh, uh, there were some they became friends with some KGB members who were walking on the march and took to them and you know like Nelson Mandela made friends with some of his guards there's always people in every situation who were you know maybe have an alternative idea and also because the year after that, so that was 87, then in 88, they, um, they organized another march over here with Soviets and Americans over here. And the Soviet government let the citizens come here. And then in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. You know, what, how much effect did, did those things have? It had some effect. There are some, some of my friends from the Beast March say, we did it. You know, well, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure, but it had some effect. You know, had, it had some effect. So, um, or maybe it was all a symptom of that this was going to happen anyway, but it was all of a part. So, um, you know, since then, I've put my own efforts into two areas. One is writing, because I started to realize that I love being on the Peace March. I would do it again, you know. I'd do it five more times. I mean, yeah. how great is that? But, but um, if you have... A skill as a writer, then you can reach many, many more people through writing. And uh, my last novel was called The Time of New Weather, and uh, that came out in 2008, I think, and maybe is a little ahead of its time, but have you noticed it's happened? <laughs> um, anyway, um, but the, uh, the other thing, the main thing I want to talk about is uh, consciousness. And I don't think we have a hope in hell if the human race doesn't get some more consciousness. I really don't. But I feel like there are many signs of growing consciousness. And lest we get too pessimistic, I've got a little list of ways in which 
our consciousness as human species has grown in the last 500 years. 500 years ago, the majority of nations we might call civilized believed in the divine right of kings to rule. 200 years ago, slavery was legal in this country. A hundred years ago, women couldn't vote. When I was a kid growing up in Miami, I remember driving to the other side of town, which was a good long way from Miami Beach, and, uh, and seeing segregation in action. In fact, my parents were in the hotel business in Miami Beach when Miles Davis, Miles Davis came to play, or Sammy Davis Jr. came to play at the Fountain Blue Hotel. Guess where they had to sleep? An hour away on the other side of town. So segregation in my lifetime, in my lifetime I saw it. Um, there was no ecological movement when I was born to speak of. There was no women's movement to speak of. Um, in the 1970s, we stopped the war, Vietnam War. That's never been done before, or since maybe. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but there was, before the Vietnam War, who pro who, you know, were protesters marching around uh, when Napoleon invaded the rest of Europe, you know, holding signs, you know, you know no war with Europe. You know, we, we things have come a long way. You know. um, there's the famous Martin Luther King quote, the, uh, which I'm probably going to get wrong, but it's something like, uh, the arc of, of change is long, but it bends towards justice, something like that, which is quite a thing for an uh, African-American man who grew up in his times to say. So, um, but as far as growing consciousness, we're practicing the best tools the human race has for growing consciousness. I, I don't know another tool other than meditation, mindfulness, zazen, another set of tools that have been developed precisely for that purpose. They're certainly the best ones we have for that purpose, and they've been 2,500 years in development. Now, I do believe, this can't be proven, but I believe that every person who realizes something adds to the collective realization of the human race. I believe intention matters. I believe that sending positive energy and love to the planet matters. I believe that doing meta for the, and compassion practice, all these things matter. You know? um, I also think that, um, that remembering Bernie Glassman's um, work and his, his formula for approaching change consciously um, begins with not knowing, well, I think we're all good at that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know what to do really, do we? But, uh, but that kind of not knowing also means open-mindedness. It means we never, dis we, that goes for our lives, it goes for our sangha, it goes for the center we live in. We don't know what's coming next. Uh -huh. We have to sensibly hold the past in mind, but, but maintain beginner's mind. And, um, and not have fixed ideas, not step into this situation with fixed ideas. This has never happened before. The balance of the planet has never gone out of whack like this before. We, don't, we can't possibly know what to do. Nobody does. Um, bearing witness. Well, I think we're all doing that. That's what we spent this week doing, really, with all the talks. Um, but then, now, I don't want to rewrite Bernie, but he does change his third tenet um, of the Buddhist peacemaker order. Um, I don't know what it is currently. It's been loving action. It's been compassionate action. What, do you know what it is right now? It's, it just, it's action based on maintaining a mind of not knowing and bearing witness. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. So uh, I've liked all the versions of it, yeah. Um, to take action rooted in practice, and then maybe we know what to do. Um, for me, um, I'm putting all my eggs in the consciousness basket, and apologies to the vegans. They're, you know, they're from the chickens out here. Uh, <laughs> um, I feel like 
the fact of the Dharma growing in the West and the mindfulness movement. Uh, you know, in England, there was a, uh, the Houses of Parliament did mindfulness training. Um, I don't know, I don't know that they all did, but a, but a large s section of them, like a third of them, uh, across all the political spectrum participated in mindfulness training. And uh, I heard Stephen Batchelor speak about that. And, uh, you know, he was a monk under the Dalai Lama in 1967. He was a hippie monk. He's, and he's English. He said, when I was a hippie monk under the Dalai Lama in 1967, I didn't even dream that in my lifetime that the Houses of Parliament would be investigating mindfulness like this. So, um, some of you have heard this quote uh, from Arnold Toynbee, um, the uh, well-known historian, that the 20th century's most important event, which is often overlooked by history, won't be any of the various technological innovations or even the defeat of Hitler or et cetera, et cetera. It will be the coming of the Dharma to the Western world. And um, when I first heard that, it must have been 20 years ago, I thought, well, I sure hope so. But why? Well, you know, it's really happening. I'm very involved in this mindfulness work and training mindfulness teachers. Two people here are involved in my Sage Institute training. And, um, and uh, Roshi Shishin has, has been encouraging, and maybe both Roshis have been behind it uh, the whole way. So I think there's something, I think, just providing a place where people can replenish and learn to practice and go back out and take action mindfully. You know, one of the things about the Great Peace March was there was a subgroup of about 50 people who all camped together and called themselves the anarchist camp. And uh, any time the Great Peace March as a whole would decide anything, they would protest against it. <laughs> so uh, they were just stuck in this protest mode, right? You know? And uh, it was so funny to see, and they didn't seem to notice it, right? You know? But I think any of us who've been involved in activism have seen that there's the streak in there of unbalanced activism, of angry activism, of people who are not in balance, and I don't blame people for being angry. I am pissed off, you know, about, about what's happened and what's happening, you know. But I sit with that, <laughs> and I try to not take action based on uncontrolled anger, you know. It, uh, it provides energy, you know, and it can be used in that way, but it needs to be transformed. Um, so, when balanced in practice, we turn towards the problems in the world. We, there's a price to pay for that, and the price of that is grief. And there's a reward, which is joy. And they go together. And we have to know that that grief is a part of turning toward the suffering of the world. But also, we need to inspire ourselves through practice, but also through engagement with nature and beauty. And. Uh, Beauty should be one of the major food groups, you know, <laughs> that, that feed the human soul, riboflavin, vitamin E, laughter, love, and beauty. There you go. Uh, um, if you combine beauty with laughter and love, you get a perfect protein. So. But I say grieve, but don't despair. And I think this is really important. A lot of us fear that if we turn towards the suffering, that will, that will fall into despair. But this is exactly what practice gives us the power not to do. Because falling into despair is a thing we do. It's not a thing that has to seize us. It can seem like it seizes us, but we can feel those feelings and not paint them into a despairing story which will make us go deeper and deeper. I, I have moments of depression for sure, and anxiety both with looking at the state of the world, but to despair would be, would be to give up 
And isn't there a famous quote by a wise monk that goes something like, the only real failure is to give up trying. <laughs> and uh, so I think we need to uh, remember that. And there's great joy in trying. You know, the Peace March was one of the high points of my life. And even though things looked kind of dire at, the point, at that point with the arms race, you know, so we were facing something quite difficult, but the collective action and the love and just the joy of that and the feeling of being engaged in something that means something. I mean, at least if we give the world, and it's, I'm talking about all my eggs are in the consciousness basket. I'm talking about giving to the world through giving to the Dharma. And the more people practice the Dharma, and the more people are exposed to meditation and mindfulness, my hope is that that's the thing that will, that will bear the right kind of fruit ultimately. Um, You know, that engaging in that, at least when we come to the end of our lives, we don't have to think, eh, I should have done more, right? You know? Um, we're a really young species. We're a really, really young species. We have a ways to go. And I hope we get to have the chance to see what we become. Um, in closing, I want to just remember our vows. Um, and um, the current version of Creations Are Numberless, I vow to receive them. Now, the first version I learned and the version we still have in the verse of the Kesa and in our meal chant is still saving sentient beings. And that's the first version I learned to save all sentient beings. And I think just about every place I've practiced has revised that because it sounded born again, salvational, Christianal, you know. Um, but more and more I'm feeling like, no, no, maybe we better get back to saving, yeah. saving those suckers, you know? <laughs> I mean, really, maybe, maybe we need to get back to reconsider, uh, you know, being, you know, a more active vow, because that's what's behind the vow, is to, is to deliver and save all beings. It's a heroic vow, mm -hmm. and we won't see the outcome in our lifetimes, but... Um, so... Just in closing, um, there's a haiku by the haiku poet Isa. I think it was from the 18th century. And uh, I think it describes our, what I've been talking about so well. Very simple. It goes something like, uh, a cricket floating on a branch downstream, singing. Of course, the right number of syllables, what we call the right number of syllables, 17, doesn't translate from the Japanese, but floating on a branch downstream, mm -hmm. a cricket singing. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I just love that image because, hey, we may feel like we're going on the branch downstream, but let's not forget to sing, <laughs> right? Um, so wouldn't it be funny? Because if you go back to the original story of the Buddha, the legend. It said that there was a prophecy when he was born that he would either be a great king or he'd be the salvation of the world. And the story goes that his father wanted to become wanted him to become a great king and uh, and therefore sequestered him in the palace and didn't let him see anything bad. And I think we all know the story. Um, but back to revisiting the mindfulness movement. I, you know, it's everywhere on the cover of Time Magazine and Newsweek and other countries and all over the world. I hear more and more about it. I've got a student in Germany who's deeply involved in mindfulness with Syrian refugees. It's all over Europe. It's spreading all over the world. Wouldn't it be funny if, uh, if in the end it was the salvation of the world, you know? Um, wouldn't it be funny if that prophecy did come true, that 2,500, 2,600 years later, that <laughs> That consciousness was the thing that turned us around. I figure the Dharma is as good a candidate as anything for world salvation. So thank you all. <laughs>